Querido Fernando, es un gran placer tenerla acá en Alemania. Un gran Dear Fernando, it's a great pleasure to have you here in Germany. A great honor to be able to interview you. This year marks, or in fact has already marked, 10 years since your release, after having spent more than 15 years of your life in a prison in Atlanta, United States. Can you tell us a bit about how all that happened? Because in Germany, the coverage of your case, and of the other four heroes, was quite limited, or if there was any, it was partial. So, to start, can you tell the German people why you were sent to the United States? What was your mission there? And also, why did the United States justice system sentence you to such harsh sentences as in your case? Thank you for the interview and to the readers and viewers of this program. To be fair, you are right about the limited media coverage, which was dominated by large commercial interests with a clear political bias. However, it is important to highlight that we also received enormous solidarity from friends in Germany who joined an international campaign for our release. Despite the scant coverage, they understood our arguments and supported the solidarity campaign. We were part of a group of Cubans in South Florida whose goal was to prevent terrorist actions against Cuba. Since the triumph of the Cuban Revolution, terrorism by extremist Cuban groups has been used by the United States as an instrument of its foreign policy against Cuba, seeking to destabilize and, if possible, overthrow the revolutionary government. Groups of Cubans, settled in South Florida for years, even decades, have conspired and have been financed from the United States to plan and execute violent actions against Cuba and its interests in other countries, including Europe. An example of this is our embassy in Portugal, which in the 80s was attacked with an explosive device placed by Cubans residing in South Florida. There have been incidents in other Latin American countries where Cuban commercial offices have been victims of terrorist acts. Within Cuba, there have also been attacks, amounting to more than 2,000 victims of terrorism financed and organized from the United States. For this reason, Cuba had to have people in South Florida to know the plans that were being made, how those plans were financed, how the explosives and weapons were obtained. This allowed keeping the Cuban government informed to prevent and avoid the loss of human lives and damage to the economy and the country in general. This includes the possible loss of lives of non-Cuban citizens, as happened in the 90s, when an explosive device in a Havana hotel caused the death of an Italian citizen. In that incident, American citizens could also have died, both in actions within Cuba and in attacks by these terrorist groups in other countries against Cuban interests. Our mission was to inform the Cuban government about the plans, how these groups are financed, the training they carry out and receive, and how they are organized to execute these terrorist plans. The goal was to avoid the loss of human lives and material damage. That was the role we played. In 1998, we were arrested, a group of 10 people, by the Federal Bureau of Investigation of the United States Department of Justice. We were subjected to a trial with great bias, evidenced by the treatment given to us by the press, the limits imposed on our defense, and the impossibility of finding in Miami precisely where all this is planned and where the media constantly project an apocalyptic and biased vision of Cuba against the Cuban government, an impartial jury. Our lawyers did everything possible to argue that the trial should not take place in Miami. However, their arguments were not heard, and in the end, the trial was carried out in that context of anti-government euphoria against Cuba. Therefore, there was no possibility of obtaining a fair trial or a balanced analysis of the evidence presented. In summary, that is the reason why we were in the United States and how we ended up serving sentences that precisely reflect that imbalance. If one compares the crimes we were accused of with the scant evidence presented, in many cases it does not justify how we were found guilty. Much less does it explain the extent of the sentences to which we were condemned.
extensión de la sentencia a la que fuimos eh, condenados. Yes, it was a political mistake from my point of view. Realmente es todo el proceso estuvo viciado de matiz. Really, the whole process was tainted with political nuances and permeated by a political vision of an issue that should have been legal. Esto se expresó en la This was reflected in the sentences to which we were condemned. Even after being convicted, I believe that the weight and seriousness of the existing evidence against us could have been assessed and that this could have influenced a more comprehensive and balanced sentence in relation to the severity or not of the facts for which we were unjustly found guilty. The sentences were extremely prolonged. Some colleagues even received life sentences without there really being evidence to support and justify it. Well, it seems to me that this ruling was also somewhat a symbol of the United States' policy towards Cuba in general. So it condemned Cuba in a certain way, not only us as individuals. How do you explain this almost obsession that the United States has had for more than 60 years with Cuba, an island not so small, but yes, a Caribbean island? Does Cuba still present a real threat to the United States? I believe the obsession is due to the inability of the U.S. authorities to understand and accept that Cuba is a free, independent, and sovereign country. Cuba does not have to submit to the whims of the United States, a country that not only has wanted to take over the island, but also has not wished well for the Cuban people. Since our struggles for independence in the 19th century, starting with the revolution in 1868, and then in its second stage in 1895, when José Martí organized the continuation of the war for independence, to the stage led by Fidel Castro, who stated that the revolution is won from its beginning in 1868, seeking our true independence. At none of those moments did the United States government support those fighting for independence. During our struggles for independence, the United States assumed a waiting position to take over Cuba when the conditions were right. This happened in 1898, when the fighters for Cuba's independence had an advantage over the Spanish colony. And although independence was not imminent, it was evident that it would be achieved. There was an incident, the explosion of an American ship in a Havana port that was visiting. This incident, whose details are still not fully clarified, but are very suspicious, was used as a pretext for military intervention and the occupation of Cuba. If we analyze the history of the United States since its independence in 1776, we find that, in the political thought of important figures of the American establishment, there was the idea that Cuba, due to its geographical location and proximity, should be part of the United States. At that time, the United States was in a process of formation, having become independent as 13 colonies on the East Coast and then beginning its expansion. The mentality of the American political class was of permanent expansion, which led to seizing territories from the Native Americans and Mexico. A large part of Mexican territory was taken in the years 1848 and 1850 in wars promoted with the aim of occupying those territories. In this expansionist mentality, Cuba was also included. Let's remember that José Martí begins to organize the second stage of the struggle for Cuba's independence in 1895. He leaves in his political will a letter found in his possession when he dies in combat. This letter is considered his political testament. In it, Martí expresses that the struggle for Cuba's independence was not only seeking the island's independence, but also to prevent the United States from using Cuba as a springboard to take over the territories of the Antilles and America. Martí had seen in the government of the United States the intention to take over not only Cuba, but also the rest of the Antilles, and use them as a bridge to expand its influence over Latin America and the Caribbean. Therefore, it was very difficult for the North American political class to understand 
that when Fidel Castro conceives and carries out the Cuban Revolution and it triumphs, Cuba truly becomes independent from the tutelage of the United States government, which until that moment dictated what could and could not be done in Cuba. Cuba, until the year 1959, was a neo-colony. Although it had a Cuban government elected by Cubans, in reality, it was an appendage of the United States. The economy was totally dependent on the United States, and the Cuban government enforced in our country the will of the U.S. government. The Cuban Revolution in the year 1959 put an end to that dependency. A process of independence for the country began, in which Cuba not only affirmed its independence and sovereignty over Cuban territory, but also decided on a policy for the country, unrelated to the interests of the United States. This caused annoyance and immediately created animosity from the government of the United States, which from the beginning of the revolution started to conspire to try to overthrow the government of Cuba. Observing the history of the Cuban Revolution, it is evident that the government of the United States has used all possible methods to try to get rid of the revolutionary government of Cuba, including terrorism. Cubans who migrated to the United States after the Cuban Revolution were organized by the United States Central Intelligence Agency into clandestine groups and counter-revolutionary organizations. These groups infiltrated Cuba, organized sabotage against the Cuban economy, attacks against the main leaders of the revolution, placed explosives in shopping centers, and blew up economic targets. They used terrorism, biological warfare, psychological warfare, threats of force use, military invasions, including the invasion of the Bay of Pigs in 1961. In addition, they conducted military maneuvers around the island to pressure and subject Cuba to constant siege, not only economically, such as the economic, commercial, and financial blockade imposed since 1962, but also with the real threat of a military invasion by the United States. We have been under constant pressure from the United States government, which does not accept the fact that Cuba is an independent, democratic, sovereign country, and that Cubans decide by our own will how we organize and organize our society. The inability of the United States government to accept this reality is what has led it to carry out all these types of actions against Cuba. Talking about the independence and sovereignty of Cuba, it leads me to think about Guantanamo, because despite everything, Cuba is not completely sovereign in territorial terms due to the Guantanamo naval base. Do you see any perspective for the United States to be legally obliged to withdraw? Or is there any measure in the context of international law that could facilitate this process? The illegality of the Guantanamo base for us is evident. In international law, there are clauses that establish if a treaty was not negotiated in good faith, said treaty is flawed from the start and therefore not legally valid. This is not the only reason that questions the legality of the naval base in Guantanamo. They occupied that territory after a military occupation of Cuba. During the negotiation process of a constitution, which was supposed to reflect the independence of Cuba, the United States imposed, through an amendment approved in its Congress and not in Cuba, the need to have a military base in our country. The U.S. government warned the Cuban constituents that if they did not approve the constitution with that amendment, Cuba would not obtain its independence. Therefore, it was an act of coercion which invalidates the existence of that military base from the beginning. A treaty like this lacks legality, since in law, both in Cuba and the rest of the world, what is achieved through force or the threat of its use is not accepted as legal. No country in the world would accept it. So how to make the government of the United States today accept this illegality is complex. 
I believe that the United States maintains that military base, not because it really serves them from a military standpoint. I am not a specialist in these matters, but it seems that for a long time, that base has not had the utility it might have had at some point for controlling, for example, traffic through the Panama Canal. In my opinion, there may be other elements, but I believe that what weighs most in the case of the United States for not closing that base is the fact of keeping it to annoy Cuba, because really from a military point of view, it does not seem to have much utility. It would be part of a negotiation at some point when the United States decides to accept the independence and sovereignty of Cuba and negotiate a normalization of relations between the two countries. One can understand that the relationship between Cuba and the United States will never be normal as long as the blockade exists and as long as that military base exists. There may exist, as today, diplomatic relations, although the communication between the two governments is limited. During the last two years of Obama's presidency in the United States, there was a moment when conversations were established to gradually normalize the relationship between Cuba and the United States. But also with quite a bit of resistance within the Democratic Party itself. Little by little, this could lead to normalization. There cannot be a normal relationship between the two countries when a country with the dimensions and power of the United States tries to suffocate the economy of an island that, although it is only 90 miles away and is larger than Jamaica, with its 11 million inhabitants, is still small compared to the United States, which has 320 million inhabitants and is the world's leading economy. The relationship also cannot be normal while that great power maintains a military base on Cuban territory against the will of the people of Cuba. These will be key elements to consider when the United States decides to move forward with the normalization of relations with Cuba. I do not see in the near future that the United States agrees to withdraw the military base from Guantanamo, close it, and return that territory to the Cuban people for their administration. I do not see it happening in the near future. Perhaps it will be a task for our grandchildren. Perhaps it will be a task for our grandchildren. At the beginning, you mentioned the support of the Solidarity Network from Germany towards Cuba, but also towards the situation of the five. Today, you are the president of ICAP, the Cuban Institute of Friendship with the Peoples. In this context, I would be interested in knowing what role the Solidarity Movement with Cuba plays in Germany. I believe that in Germany there are many very good friends of Cuba. We are very grateful for the solidarity we have received from the German people and from the different solidarity organizations with Cuba that exist in Germany, in various cities and territories. We have a solidarity network with Cuba that has an executive and groups around 39 solidarity organizations present in the German territory. In addition, there are other organizations that are not included in this network, but the work of all has been very important. We receive political support for our demand for respect for our sovereignty and our independence as well as support for the struggle of the Cuban people for the lifting of the economic, commercial, and financial blockade that the government of the United States has applied against Cuba for 62 years, trying to suffocate Cuba's economy. We receive a lot of moral support from the solidarity organizations with Cuba and Germany, some of which have been established for 50 years, such as the FRG Cuba Friendship Association and Berlin Cuba. The Berlin-Cuba Friendship Association, for example, has been operating uninterruptedly in solidarity with Cuba for 50 years. And thus other organizations, in addition to political and moral support to our claims, also provide material solidarity with our country.
con proyectos de colaboración solidaria. They have been carrying out collaborative solidarity projects in our country for many years, such as Kubasi or Odo, which are organized to send resources in the form of donations to our country, both for our health system and our educational system. Let's remember the period of the 90s, known in Cuba as the Special Period, when after the collapse of the socialist camp, Cuba lost 85% of its foreign trade and experienced a 35% reduction in its gross domestic product. At that time, for many countries including Germany, solidarity aid arrived in Cuba, especially for our health system and our educational system, both very damaged. Solidarity with Cuba from Germany both from the point of view of moral and political support to our claim for respect for our sovereignty and independence, as well as in the claim to eliminate the blockade and to return the territory illegally occupied in Guantanamo, has been significant. The support from the point of view of defending the main achievements of the revolution, which are free and universal health for our people, and also free education for all Cubans throughout the national territory, has also been important. The support of German friends has been crucial for Cuba to be able to sustain those two achievements. To get an idea, from your perspective or knowledge, which would be the most supportive country in Europe towards Cuba from the point of view of civil society? This is without getting into a competition, just to understand the respective activities. It is very difficult to make a comparison or establish a competition about which solidarity movement in a country is more supportive. Solidarity exists in many countries in Europe and beyond. At the Institute, we have links with more than 1,600 solidarity organizations across five continents, covering 152 countries. However, I can say that solidarity in Germany is very well organized. The colleagues are very serious in their work, both men and women. They have clear objectives, organize their activities very well, and are well structured. It is a broad and conscious movement which studies and knows the Cuban reality well. It is also important the incorporation of new generations to see more German youth involved in solidarity. Solidarity not only has an educational function, but also allows people to think beyond their own borders and personal interests, approaching other realities that may need supportive help, not necessarily material. In addition to Cuba, there are other causes, such as those of the Palestinian or Sahrawi people, who face difficult situations. Participating in solidarity actions has an educational value for the human being beyond the political. I believe, and I don't want to get philosophical, but I believe it also has a lot to do with the ability to find happiness. I think no one is happy thinking only of themselves. Contributing to others also helps with that feeling of satisfaction and a broader conception of happiness. And notice that I didn't put it in political terms. It's not only about, although it can be in some cases, political or ideological identification. I'm talking here about human values. And I believe that here in Germany, among that movement of solidarity with Cuba, but with other causes as well, those values are widespread. We find them among many Germans. That desire to contribute, that desire to help others, whether in Cuba or elsewhere, is very widespread. Yes, I believe I reiterate that it would be important for the new generations to join in and participate in that way of seeing things and in other causes. A somewhat abrupt change, but speaking with friends returning from Cuba, or also when talking with Cuban friends, many mention that currently Cuba is going through a, let's say, difficult time. Some even refer to what you already mentioned, this special period in the early 90s. From your point of view, do you share this perspective, let's say, that Cuba is going through a really difficult time, and if so, what are the main challenges of the current situation? I believe so. 
Cuba is currently going through a very complex situation from an economic standpoint. I don't think it's the same as the crisis of the special period in the 90s. At that time, Cuba lost 85% of its foreign trade and 35% of its gross domestic product. Today, the situation of the Cuban economy is different. Back then, the Cuban economy was practically 100% state-run. Today, it is a more diversified economy. There is the state sector, the cooperative sector, both agricultural and non-agricultural, foreign investment, and private ownership, including small and medium-sized enterprises. Moreover, our foreign trade is more diversified, and we have a broader connection than what existed at the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the European Socialist Bloc which maintained most of our foreign trade and forced a reorientation. Although the two moments are different, and considering that the former was more critical, I believe we are in a very difficult moment of the Cuban economy. The fundamental cause of this extremely difficult moment is the economic war that the government of the United States has waged against Cuba for more than 62 years. Despite this economic war, which has existed for more than 62 years, Cuba has found a way to navigate it one way or another. When we were part of the Socialist Bloc and members of the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance, we had a large percentage of our trade oriented towards exchange with socialist countries. Therefore, the capacity of the economic warfare carried out by the government of the United States to impact our economy was limited. Although it affected us, the impact was not extraordinary. With the disappearance of the socialist bloc, Cuba had to reorient all its foreign trade and insert itself into a market and international finances dominated by big capital. This marked the beginning of another type of economic relations, and the impact of the United States' economic war against Cuba began to be felt more severely. This economic war has intensified, especially during the presidency of Donald Trump in the United States. All ways to limit Cuba in terms of financing possibilities and obtaining the necessary energy to run its economy and to supply electricity to the population were sought. The shipping companies that transported that fuel were pursued. Finally, nine days before leaving the presidency, Donald Trump once again included Cuba on the list of state sponsors of terrorism. Without any legal basis or evidence, Cuba, which has been more than anything a victim of terrorism, finds itself reintegrated into a list for political reasons. This automatically prevents it from accessing international finances. The entire international financial system is controlled by surveillance mechanisms that, supposedly to fight terrorism, cause any financial transaction to Cuba to raise an alert and be automatically blocked if the country is on the list of terrorism sponsors. Thus, being an underdeveloped country with few resources, Cuba needs external financing, whether in terms of credit or foreign investment. However, it has very limited access to the international financial system, which greatly reduces the possibility of obtaining international credits for its trade, making payments, or financing development projects and investments in the country. There is an attempt to discourage foreign investment in Cuba by all means. In this way, it is very difficult to manage the country's economic affairs in a way that allows for sustained economic growth. This is compounded by the arrival of COVID-19, which practically paralyzed the Cuban economy. The country's main source of foreign currency income is tourism. The entry of tourists into the country stopped for two years. When Cuba and the world recovered from COVID, an international economic crisis emerged. Marketing lines and trade flows were broken and disorganized, forcing a reorganization. In addition, there was inflation that affected most countries in the world. The military conflict in Ukraine caused an increase in food and energy prices, impacting our country that needs to import a large amount of supplies, even for production.
This led to a situation of scarcity in the markets, which, in turn, generated an inflationary process. The amount of money in circulation was not backed by the markets, which caused an increase in prices. A severe inflationary process was experienced that especially affected the Cuban population, especially those who depend on a fixed salary and do not have income from their own businesses. With the constant increase in prices, the salary loses purchasing power and the national currency devalues against the euro and the dollar. The country's financial capacity to acquire the necessary oil to operate its industries and generate electricity is very limited. The country has to address the population's food needs, including milk imports for children and the needs of its health system. Therefore, the state's capacity to meet all these needs is greatly restricted when it receives a limited amount of foreign currency. Today in Cuba, there is a shortage in stores and low availability of fuel, which implies power outages at certain times of the day. Despite this, the health system remains universal and is spread throughout the island, with doctors attending to people, but facing shortages of medicines and equipment to offer proper treatments. The education system remains free for the entire population, from the age of five up to university graduation, and even to pursue a doctorate, without costing a penny. However, there are material limitations in this education system. Thus, a truly critical situation is being experienced, with a high level of prices that makes the salary not enough to cover people's consumption. There are a number of retired individuals whose pensions today do not allow them to cover all their needs, or even make it difficult for them to cover their basic needs. In summary, the economic situation is severely critical. Does this economic malaise also translate into political unrest? How is this issue managed? To conclude with the economic topic, agriculture shows very low yields. This is due to the lack of resources to import fertilizers, which are not produced in Cuba, fuel for the tractors, and spare parts such as tires and batteries necessary for their operation. As a result, agriculture becomes labor-intensive, which does not favor productivity. The levels of agricultural yield have decreased, leading to a reduction in the supply of products in the markets, and therefore to high prices in the agricultural markets where food is bought. The state has had to allocate a significant part of its limited foreign income to import food that could be produced in the country. I believe that the majority of the population of Cuba understands that the main origin of these difficulties is the economic, commercial, and financial blockade. However, it is frustrating for anyone if during your eight-hour workday, four of them went by without electricity, and upon arriving home you encounter the same problem. These are elements that, after all, cause the prices of food to be high, as well as the prices of any input necessary for daily life. This translates into difficulties in obtaining basic products such as toothpaste, soap, or toilet paper, turning simple situations into difficult problems to solve. These difficulties generate discomfort and, in some sectors, irritation, which is understandable. Although an explanation is attempted, there are moments when irritation arises. I do not believe this irritation translates into political destabilization. However, our political enemies seek to take advantage of these circumstances, which are largely provoked by themselves, to foster political destabilization. They try to politicize people's irritation, giving it a connotation it really does not have. Thus, we see communication campaigns against Cuba that seek to denigrate everything that is done in the country and undermine the credibility of the Cuban government. For example, the United States Embassy can issue a tweet suggesting that the Cuban government should be more concerned about the living conditions of Cubans when it is precisely the government of the United States that has created many of the adverse conditions that Cuba faces. To this serious economic situation is added a political and communication campaign designed to make Cubans blame the Cuban government for their difficulties.
Is there any counterbalance against these actions of the United States? I mean, nowadays, there's a lot of talk about the decline of the West and how the global South, formerly called the Third World, is gaining more and more awareness and strength. But from what you explain, it seems that the American empire maintains its strength. Perhaps that would be my question. Are we overestimating the strength of the global south, of the new multipolarity, and underestimating the strength that the United States and its Western allies still have? Let's see. I think that in the case of the economic war that the United States wages against Cuba and the communication campaign that they combine with this economic war to try to make Cubans blame the Cuban government for the difficulties we face, there is of course the relationship of Cuba with other countries. These relationships are also affected by the policy of the United States government. For example, one can have links with three, four, five, or ten countries and think, can't those countries offer a loan to Cuba? The international financial systems are interconnected. But moreover, even if they offer you a loan, Cuba, precisely because of this situation, might find itself at a moment when it cannot pay back that loan. Thus, a situation is created in which, although there is an international context that could be thought of as a counterbalance to the policy of the United States, the reality is that the United States, both the government and the country itself, is gradually losing its hegemony in a historical process that is not one or two years, but rather medium and long term. It remains a powerful country. So in this circumstance that I describe, it becomes very difficult for other countries, even if they wanted to, to offer a line of credit to Cuba. It has happened that China and Russia have offered lines of credit, and it is possible to achieve it. But an underdeveloped country, without resources or with very few, needs an external source of resources for its development. This can be in terms of credit to finance projects, or in terms of foreign investment, a more fluid and permanent source. You receive a credit, you start an industry, and with what is produced by that industry, you pay part of the credit. But if you cannot complete that cycle, those cycles are interrupted. So it's very difficult for Cuba, under the current circumstances, to maintain relations with many countries in the world. It is not easy, even for those countries, to maintain a system in which the economy flows in a way that allows Cuba to keep its economy in a growth dynamic. It is very complex under the current circumstances. Despite the fact that globally the United States is losing hegemony, it still has a very strong impact in the Latin America region. Speaking of leadership, Cuba, from the 60s to the late 80s, always played a leadership role within the so-called Third World. For example, if we think about the role it played in the alliance of the non-aligned countries movement, or even militarily, like in the mission in Angola, which was key to the fall of the apartheid regime in South Africa, what role does Cuba play today in this context? Are there aspects in which you would say that Cuba still maintains a certain leadership? I believe so. The world is different now. I feel proud to have participated in Angola as part of the Cuban military contingent between the years 87 and 89, crucial years for that conflict. Cuba continues to have an active participation in the non-aligned movement. It has been president of this group. Let's remember that in 2006, when the commander-in-chief fell ill, Cuba organized a summit of the non-aligned countries, as it was the president of these countries at that time. Cuba maintains an active position in all the organs of the United Nations and presided until a few months ago over the Group of 77. It has had a leadership role in the peace negotiations of the armed conflict in Colombia. In fact, the Orthodox religious leader of Russia, during a visit to Havana, expressed that Cuba should be considered the capital of peace, precisely because of its involvement in the search for peaceful solutions 
to certain conflicts. Therefore, Cuba enjoys prestige in the international arena and in the spheres of the United Nations international organizations, where many countries negotiate with Cuba to carry common positions. I believe that Cuba continues to be a country that has prestige and certain leadership in the field of international relations, highly recognized for the seriousness of its diplomacy, for how it addresses issues, and for its perspective of always seeking a balance and a fair solution. Cuba remains a very supportive country, even in the difficult circumstances we are in. Cuba provides help to other countries in the world. In some places, the Cuban presence is compensated by those countries. But in others, which have much less resources than Cuba, it remains a supportive presence and an uncompensated support from Cuba. During the fight against COVID-19, Cuba sent 40 medical brigades to different countries around the world, despite also going through a battle against the pandemic. Cuba even sent medical brigades to countries that have many more resources than Cuba. For example, in Italy there were two Cuban medical brigades, in Azerbaijan one Cuban medical brigade, and in Andorra another Cuban medical brigade, not to mention the Cuban medical brigades that went to countries in Latin America, to Africa, and even to territories administered by France in the Caribbean. So even under these circumstances, Cuba continues to maintain and be that revolution for which solidarity has always been fundamental. Solidarity is something natural and part of how we the Cubans see the revolution. It is an intrinsic part of what we consider to be revolutionary. Therefore, I believe that Cuba continues to have that leadership role. As president of the Group of 77, the Cuban delegation led by the President of the Republic participated in numerous summits on different topics, from climate issues to the BRICS summit in South Africa. This demonstrates that Cuba maintains an international presence and prestige, as well as the willingness to contribute, which is manifested in different ways because the world has changed. However, Cuba's presence remains notable and maintains its international weight. Despite being a small island with 11 million inhabitants, Cuba has a diplomacy present in more than 120 countries around the world. The diplomatic missions in Havana are also a considerably higher number than what might exist in any other country in Latin America and the Caribbean, with the possible exception of Brazil. It is an island where the diplomatic missions of practically all the countries of the world and many international organizations are present, precisely because of Cuba's active participation in each of them. Fernando, I have many more questions, but we must finish. Thank you for your willingness for this interview, and thank you very much. Well, thank you to you and those who are watching the interview. We hope you found what we discussed interesting. Ojalá. <laughs>